Father, we come before you, giving you thanks and giving you praise, asking you to lead us and to guide us and to teach us by your Holy Spirit. We commit everything to you, Lord. We commit ourselves also, especially however tired we may be or if our minds may be distracted. Will you draw us, Lord, so that we will uh, be in your presence and also hear your voice, that we can learn and we can be changed by your word. So we thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight's title is Just Love Law. Now that's just speaking it in an English way, but you know we want to speak it in a singlish way. So can you join me? Can you say this together with me? Uh, just Love Law. I told you at the end of this we have to vote which title you like best. I'm wrecking my brain wondering how to entitle tonight's message. And uh, I, I just stumbled upon this. And for some people, looking at the word loving the law or love law, it might even be controversial. I never know these days. Sometimes people look at the word law and they say, how can you love the law? Well, it's not good. But it's okay with being controversial because today, I think we have to preach from the word and let's see what the Word tells us about the law. So let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven." This passage to me is a very important one. Not that the others are not important. But each time when we look at a passage, you know that we must look at the context of what would have been mentioned before that and what is mentioned after that. So for the last two sessions, we've been talking about salt and about light. And we concluded that being salt and being light what it must translate into is that there must be good works. There has to be good things that come out of that position, that identity and that function called good works, so that our Father in heaven will be glorified. But after this whole passage, where Jesus then talks about the law and the prophets and His explanation of it, we have His examples and His illustrations where He says, you have heard this, but I say this to you. You have heard that it was taught in this way, but this is how you really should be understanding this. And so if we look at this whole passage in its context, I think we don't have to guess too much. We know that this evening we are going to be talking about the law. What about the law? What can we learn about the law? Is the law still for us? Is it relevant? Do we throw it out? Is the law good? Is the law bad? Today we have to even try to decipher this one concept. Is the law, as is mentioned here by Jesus, is it pre-cross? That now that it's after the cross, we don't have to bother with it anymore. You see, this passage becomes so key, it becomes so important because if we miss the teaching, if we miss an understanding of this, our doctrine, our, 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 our orientation, we can go off track. This passage is also key for us to understand the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. Because Jesus is using this, again, as another transition to say, so you know the Beatitudes, you know these are the things of the kingdom, you know this is your function. Now, how are you going to move in accordance to that? We even have to ask our question as we look at this law, is it even relevant or does it apply to us as Gentile believers? It is about the law. 
And I suppose if you are sitting on that mountain and hear Jesus is coming in as the King and as the Messiah, and He's declaring this is how this is going to be, you know, you need to be doing good works. Would it be a possibility that as you are listening to Him saying all these things, it sounds easy enough? All I need to do is just get involved in being good soul and being a, a nice bright light. I'll do good works. I'll get involved in some causes. Is that all, Jesus? So does it mean that if I can accomplish all these things, then that's all there is to it. There's no longer any need of the law. There's no longer any need of the prophets. Come on, King Jesus, why don't you explain this to me? You say you are that Messiah, right? You are that Christ, right? And I believe Jesus knew what was in the hearts of people because the moment He spoke about doing good works and being salt and light, immediately He declares, Do not think. Now, why does he have to say, do not think? Because obviously, someone was thinking. So he addressed it immediately in the hearts of the people, in the minds of the people. Do not think that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. Do not for a moment even harbor that thought. Don't presume this because it's wrong. And then he goes on to the next passage. He says, For assuredly I say to you, the law will not be taken away. Do not think, not for a moment. Assuredly, verily, truly, amen, amen. The law is here to stay. I've shared in a teaching before this that, you know, when Jesus comes onto this scene and on top of this mountain as he's delivering this message, he comes as the new Moses. Moses, as he went up to Mount Sinai, he received the law on that mountain from God and then he delivered it to the people of God. Jesus as the new Moses is not just a law deliverer in that sense or giving to the people. Jesus himself is the lawmaker because he comes onto the scene and he is the Christ. And if, he's, if he is the Christ and he's saying, look, I am the Christ here, I'm saying to you, don't even think the law is going to be moved away. Assuredly, I say to you, every part of this law is going to be fulfilled. I, as the Messiah, I uphold and I establish God's law. Now, if that's the case, then the law that we're talking about, do you think it would be correct to call it the law of Christ? It is the law of the Christ. He says, I uphold it. In other words, this is not just God's law. This is my law. As the king coming onto the scene, as the Messiah, as the Christ, I'm upholding this. Now, I know sometimes we look at this and we never think of it before, right? We always look at it as the Mosaic law. But who gave Moses the law? God. Who is Jesus? God. Who is the Christ? God. And so the law of God equals the law of Christ. There's no difference to that. Let's unpack this a little bit. I think we need to know what this law is all about. To the Hebrew, the entire law is called the Tanakh. And it can be classified into three groups called the Torah, the Nevim, or the Ketuvim. And collectively, it comprises the law, the prophets, and the writings. So when Jesus says, the law and the prophets, I have not come to abolish, I've come to fulfill. He's really saying, I've come to fulfill the entire Hebrew scriptures as we understand it. Now we use this word law, and honestly, when we look at the word law, it doesn't sound positive to us. But in the Bible, in the Old Testament, you will find that there are many other words that are used to describe the entirety of the law of God. You can call them testimonies. If you read in Psalm 119, you can call them judgments. We even use the word statutes. Generally, we refer it to God's word, the word of God. We also use this word precepts or commandments or promise or even God's way. So there are different words to describe the entirety of the law of God. So if you don't like the word law, you can replace it with any one of these. That's fine. But we also know that this law is divided into three types of law within which you will find a ceremonial law, a moral law, and a civil law. 
Now, ceremonial laws, of course, the things of the, uh, what they do within the temple, the, the kind of worship, the things that they have to do to get into the presence of God and to have that relationship with God. The moral law is obviously how a person needs to conduct himself for himself and also with someone else. The civil law is about the same, but it extends to a certain nation, right? The people of Israel, where they have their own set of laws. And sometimes they overlap here and there, but generally these are the three things that we look at. But essentially, when we look at this one word law, I want us to understand that when we look at this Bible here, when we call this book called the Bible, and the Bible literally means book. Essentially, whatever God gives to us recorded upon Scripture, what He gives is a revelation of Himself, who He is, and what He stands for. And you and I know that God is immutable, He is unchanging, He is consistent, and in that sense, if God does not change, then His Word is also the same, it also does not change. And so Jesus says, this Word will stand. It's consistent. There's nothing wrong with this word. It will stand from the smallest letter. One jod, one yod, and one yota. Okay, the smallest letter in the Hebrew or even in the Greek. From the smallest letter to the smallest dash, that tittle. Everything will be fulfilled. Nothing will be missed. And I like that phrase that Jesus used. Till heaven and earth pass away. So, has heaven and earth, have they passed away? Now, you and I know it has not passed away. So, if heaven and earth both have not passed away, guess what? The law stands. Nothing is going to be removed. The law is still there. It's still very, very appropriate. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. The grass with us, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. In Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Forever. It stands. God's laws, His words, His commandments, His ways, His precepts, His judgment, it stands. Till heaven and earth pass away, all will be fulfilled. You say, oh, but that's Old Testament. I say, okay, let's look at the New Testament. Where is the place of the Hebrew Scripture in the New Testament? We know 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, where Paul writes to Timothy, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is good for reproof, for doctrine, and so on and so forth. All Scripture. What was Paul referring to when he said all Scripture? It was only the Hebrew Scriptures. There was no such thing as a New Testament until the New Testament was compiled years later. The only scripture that Timothy had was the Tanakh. And so the New Testament church at that time still would stand on the Word of God, the law of God, the law of Christ. It is relevant. Until heaven and earth pass away, the law will still stand. If you have your Bibles, you can go to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 5 and 7. That's a, that's a very interesting thing there. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. Verse 7. But the heavens and earth which are now preserved by the same word. You see, the apostle was very, very clear. By the word of God, it's not just one word that he spoke, but his entire establishment of the heavens and the earth was by his ways, by his nature, by his wisdom, by his commands, by his judgment. The heavens and earth were created by that system, by that logos, because in the beginning was the word, and nothing was made that was not made through him. Amen? Everything was created by that word. But not only was it created by the Word, it is preserved by the Word. God's laws and God's Word preserves everything, and that's why it has to stand. Otherwise, heaven and earth will perish. But you and I know one day, 
this heaven and this earth will pass. And we look to new heavens and new earth. Does it mean that God's word does not apply anymore? No. It continues to come in, but in a different form. It still will be relevant. So we have to understand this law of Christ as we go on into the next part. Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. Now you know what the law and the prophets is all about. Jesus did not come to destroy it nor to abolish it. He came to fulfill it. Let's look at these two words, destroy and to fulfill. In a traditional understanding, we being church people, Christians, this is traditionally how we will understand fulfill or to destroy. We say Jesus has fulfilled the law. He said He came to fulfill it. So now on hindsight, we look back and we say, yeah, that's true. Jesus kept the Torah or the law perfectly. There was no one else who could keep it perfectly. And that is true. So in that sense, He fulfilled the law correctly and perfectly. I was reading one commentary and it was very interesting. This writer said, Jesus fulfilled the law perfectly. But do you know, He did not fulfill every law that was in the law. Of course, when we look at that one line first, you know, you sort of, uh, huh? A bit of a shock, right, to us. Yeah? But he said it's true, right? There were some laws that were for women who was going through a time of uh, unclean stage. Jesus was not a woman. He didn't have to fulfill that law. So he's correct. Jesus fulfilled whatever he had to fulfill perfectly, but not necessarily each and every one of that law. But see, traditionally we would say, you know, he fulfilled all the law. The second thing that we understand usually is that Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament messianic types and prophecies. And that's an amen. We agree with that. So in that sense, he fulfilled the prophetic word. He fulfilled whatever was needed that was established in that law as it would be applied to Old Testament messianic types and prophecies. We look back and we say, yes, Jesus provided a way of salvation that meets the righteous requirements of the law. And that's correct. That's also an amen. He had to be that substitute. A sacrifice was needed. And in being both the substitute and the sacrifice, He provided the satisfaction to God's judgment upon sin. And so we agree with all that. So that's a traditional view of understanding Jesus coming to fulfill the law. But be careful because when we look at this and if we paint such a big broad stroke, we tend then to generalize this to mean that since Jesus fulfilled everything, then that's why the law is no more needed for all of us. Can you see this tendency? I'm not saying everyone believes in that, but I'm saying we can stretch it and push it to an extreme and, and catch the wrong picture, which I think is prevalent in certain cases today. Jesus has fulfilled everything, so we don't have to do anything. Nothing is required of us. Let's close in prayer. This is the traditional understanding of how Jesus fulfilled the law. But for a Jew, they would understand a Jewish rabbinic understanding that this line to fulfill the law or to destroy and abolish the law was actually a rabbinic idiom. That if a rabbi says that he has to fulfill the law, in his mind, what he's thinking about is to correctly interpret the law. It has to do with interpretation. Because if you interpret it correctly, then you are able to obey it to its fullest intent. Can you catch this? So that's the meaning for a rabbi when he says, I'm here to fulfill the law. But if one abolishes or destroys it, then the converse is true. It means to misinterpret it, to miss the big picture, to miss the intention and thereby to apply it wrongly. Because Jesus now says, I'm not here to abolish it. I'm not here to push it one side. By no means. You know, the law stands. 
And as it is remaining there for us, then we need to interpret it correctly. Jesus is saying, let's look at the interpretation. Jesus was not so much against the Pharisees than he was against their interpretation of the law. See, many times we look at this one word Pharisee and immediately we have a very negative picture of this group of people. Now, it's very natural because that's how we've been taught and that's how our orientations would be. And although Jesus would pick at them and point at them later on, here, what he's saying is, look, it's not so much about the Pharisees. It's about their wrong interpretation of the law. But is it all about just interpretation? I believe Jesus expects His law to be kept. I don't think there's a king that comes to say, this is my law, and he says, you don't have to worry anything about it. No. He goes on and in the passage says, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in this kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Immediately, he continues in his teaching and in his sermon He talks about those who break the law and those who keep the law. If he doesn't want people to keep the law, then why talk about it? Jesus expects his law to be kept. But how do you keep the law? Everything hinges upon interpretation. You interpret correctly, you fulfill the law. You interpret wrongly, you destroy or you cancel or you abolish that law. Everything hinges on interpretation. And who better to listen to than a king himself coming to give you the right interpretation? But don't miss this point. There's going to be greatness in the kingdom and it's related to obedience. See, sometimes we think we're all going to be the same. Paul in the New Testament says the same thing that not all will receive the same glory. It's consistent. So greatness in the kingdom is linked to obedience of the laws of the kingdom. But then Jesus then goes on to say, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and of the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So suddenly he talks about the righteousness of the Pharisees and how God's people or Jesus' kingdom people needs to exceed the righteousness of this group of people. So I think it's also important for us to examine a little bit the righteousness of the Pharisees. As I said to you just now, because of how the Pharisees have been presented, we automatically presume that Jesus was condemning their righteousness. Immediately, right? I don't know about you, but when I reach this verse, usually my my first thought is, ah, you see, their righteousness, lousy, no good. But now today, I am better than them. Thank you, Jesus. Right? That's my tendency to think that way. But you know that if you go into the history and the context, Jesus was not coming against them per se. He was actually speaking in support of them. Why? Because not all Pharisees are to be tarred with the same brush. There were good Pharisees. There were good Pharisees. Let me quote Matthew chapter 23, verses 2 to 3 for you. Jesus actually says this, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. I mean, if these guys were lousy and teaching even wrong things, why would Jesus say that? But he doesn't stop there. Later on, we will see, he actually says, but do not do according to their works, for they say and they do not do. So what they taught, that's okay. But how they apply it themselves or don't apply, that's the problem. You see, so there were good Pharisees. They were intending to get the law right. They were not working for their salvation, actually. They were working from their salvation. Are you surprised? 
That's another presumption, right? For us that we think, oh, you know what? They're trying to be righteous so they can be saved. To a Jewish mind, they are already saved. And because they are saved, they want to live right. They were not working for their salvation. They were working from their salvation. That's applicable even for us. They had a high regard for God's law. A very high regard. They were sincerely trying to do their best to please God. And do you know what was their motivation? They knew the consequences of breaking the law. That happened for them, the people of Israel, and they were kicked out of the land. And so when God saved them and delivered them from the hands of the enemy, and God brought them back into the land again, they have been saved once more. They better get it right this time, you see? They had a very high regard for God's laws because they understood the repercussions and the consequences of breaking God's law. And what they did to the best of their intention was that they erected what we call fences. It's a rabbinic style. That if there's this law that needs to be kept and we have to be protected from this one law that we do not break it, what they do is that they do a fence around it to say, before you get to this, you better not do this. And they put like five fences or ten fences around this one law. So instead of one law, now you have ten. But the intention was good that they would be able to keep it or at least not be able to break it, that they would be able to please God. It was well-meaning. In other words, better to be saved than sorry. And so you have heard of many stories, right, about uh, the the Sabbath lift and all that. You cannot work on Sabbath. uh, So better don't give you any chance to work. So there's there's a Sabbath lift that has only got one button. or No, sorry, it has got no buttons. It just, you just go in and so you don't have to press anything so you don't work. Now today we look at it and we listen to it and we, we smile or we laugh, you know, but that's how careful they are. But in trying to get it all right, they got it all wrong. They added law after law after law and they started to police all these things. It became rigid, it became legalistic. And it became condemning, it was burdensome, it was difficult for them. And here comes the worst part, because it was so difficult, no one could keep the law. Even the Pharisees themselves, who who, who put in place all these safeguards, they couldn't do it. And because they couldn't do it, they become hypocrites, they tell someone to do it, and they didn't do it. And even worse, after that, they had personal agenda, because they had a pride of place, it became political. And they appeared to be very pious and to be doing this for God, but in reality, they were doing it for themselves. They were greedy for money, they were greedy for power, they were greedy for position. They were trying to get it right, but they got it all wrong. Over time, it became an outward display. That outside, they would look and perform as if they were were all righteous and being very good for God, but inside, you know, their motivation was questionable. And although they kept the law, the problem was that they did not reflect the God that the law was supposed to reflect. This was the problem for this group of the Pharisees. See, they intended to get it right, but they got it wrong. So when we look at this fun phrase where Jesus says, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. I believe he was was looking at the, the good parts, and it says, you know how they keep it so well? How they fulfill everything? This is what you should be. You must exceed this. Do the good stuff. There's nothing wrong with keeping the law. I mean, I cannot imagine a king who comes to someone who keeps the law even 90% well and say, you know, don't even follow them. 90% no good. That would be preposterous, right? That's ridiculous. In fact, if I see someone doing 90%, I will say, man, go for it, man. we got to be better than this. This is how it's going to be. But don't exceed the other part. Don't be a big hypocrite. Don't exceed hypocrisy. Don't exceed their wrong motivations. That's not what Jesus is talking about. 
He says, your righteousness has to exceed this. And if you were one of those people or the disciples sitting down there and Jesus says this, immediately you're going to go, whoa. I mean, if they, are, if, they are, if, they are, if they are marking 90%, I cannot even. It's like you asking me to, to swim for the Olympic team like that, you know. I can't even make it. I can't even smell their smoke. And then he says, if your righteousness does not exceed, you won't enter the kingdom. I imagine that kind of a shocker, right? And here I want to give you five points here. Five quick observations. In rightly interpreting His law, His own law. This is the law of Christ. This is God's law. If Jesus is God, Jesus upholds the law. He says, this is how it's to be done. Jesus didn't make it easier. He made it more challenging. If you read the Sermon on the Mount, this is true, is it not? He said, this is the right way to interpret it. He didn't make it easier for the people. He actually showed that it was more challenging. It's common rabbinic practice. The rabbis would teach the disciples, and the disciples of different schools, of rabbinic schools, they'll come together, they'll, they'll talk, they'll debate, they'll, they'll talk about interpretations. Jesus doing us exactly the same thing. As a rabbi, he comes on and he interprets the law. And he doesn't make it easier. In those days, there were two schools. One was called the Hillel, and the other one was called the Shammai school. And this rabbi called Hillel, he was known for a very strict interpretation of the law. The other one is the Shammai school, and he would be more gentle and more moderate, and today we may call it liberal. And these were the two main schools, and people were discussing and debating all this. So let's take an example of Hillel, of what he says and how he interprets the entire law. He says, whatever is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. This is the whole Torah and the rest is commentary. If you just remember this, okay? Whatever is hateful to you, then don't do to someone else. This is what the law is to Hitler. And he was already very, very strict. He says, okay, not easy to keep up. Huh? Jesus comes and he flips it around. Because later on you'll find that in the summary of his Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, he says, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, you do to them. He turns it around. It's not that you withhold things that you don't want to do to people. You actually do good things to people that you want people to do to you. That's even tougher. Go the distance. That's what Jesus is trying to say. He didn't make it easier. He made it more challenging. Is it not true? The second point. We are usually satisfied with the minimum. But here comes the Christ and He says, go for the maximum. This is what God is all about. This is what His law is all about. Are you like me? I do just enough so that I don't get caught. I'm happy with just the minimum. I can pass enough already. Lah. As long as I don't break it, can already. Just scrape through. Just enough. Jadi, enough. And many Christians can be like this, right? I mean, you think about it, we keep debating, how much should we give? Is it the tithe? Is it not the tithe? Because if you say it's the tithe, then I just give 10%, enough. 10.1%, I won't even think about it. When I give 10%, I fulfill the law. Jesus is saying, don't go for the minimum. Go for the maximum. So don't talk about tithe. If you're only looking at tithe, you're not fulfilling the law in its full intent. It's very quiet suddenly now. <laughs> Why are we debating with all this kind of stuff? If you listen to Rabbi Jesus, then you put your hand on your heart. Have you only been doing the minimum? Jesus says, go for the maximum. Go for it, man. This is the expression of God in and through His law. We're always looking for methods. But Jesus will go straight for the motivation. What should I do? How should I do? Which step? Uh? Step one, step two, step three. Uh? Can I do this? Can I not do that? Uh? Uh, just tell me. Uh, yes or no. Jesus says, look, let me just look at your heart and I'll tell you exactly what it is. It's not about whether you want to do or don't want to do or should you do or should you not do. What is the motivation deep within? 
Don't look at only the big issues. Jesus goes straight into the heart. He's looking at a very, very small issue. But that's where it begins. Because he knows his Old Testament. You remember the phrase, sin crouches at the door of your heart? Don't allow it to master you. In other words, don't give it any opportunity or any foothold. If you identify it, deal with it. That's the essence of the law. It's not trying to get away that you don't, you don't break something else. Oh, I, I don't commit adultery. I'm still married with my wife. So I guess pornography is fine. Jesus says, no. It's not about you not committing adultery. The moment you have lust in your heart, deal with that. That's even tougher, right? See, Jesus didn't make it easier. He made it more difficult. And that's why later on you'll read the provisions in the six examples. You have heard that it was said like this. That's how they interpret it. Not necessarily wrong, but not the fullness of the intention of what the law is. But I say this to you. The first thing I observe is then this. Our dependence is on our flesh. But we can only exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees by His Spirit. This is what Jesus was trying to show the people. You've got to catch the spirit of the king to be able to live the laws of the king. If you only try to look at the law in the flesh and by your own flesh, then you only try and do it for yourself to sort of please the king, but not move in the fullness of what the king has for us. Jesus meets with Nicodemus, a righteous Pharisee, sincerely seeking answers. And he tells Nicodemus in no uncertain terms, you have to be born again. First, you have to be born again, you see the kingdom. Then after that, you're born again, to, that you can enter the kingdom. You need the Holy Spirit. You need the Spirit of the King to be able to keep the laws of the King that will exceed the righteousness of the best of the best of the Pharisees. Because by your flesh, you know you are limited. You will never be able to keep it completely and totally well. You need a new birth. You need to come into a new covenant where God's laws are no longer placed upon you on the outside. God's laws are now written upon this new heart that you have received through this new birth. Sometimes you've got to look at God's Word and read it in between the lines. If you tell me the law is no longer relevant, then when God writes His law upon your heart, what laws is that? I cannot understand someone who tells me, God's laws is no more relevant. Oh, it's written upon my heart. What did he write? Oh, before that it was on tablets of stone, but now it's on tablets of heart. What did he write? Oh, it's laws, but it's a different law. You mean God changed? It's not consistent, amen? What it means is that we need a new birth. So that in that new covenant, what it means is we, we break away from the old. The only way you can be taken away from the old is that you have to die. That's what a covenant is all about. Someone has to die. And the king died for us. That we may be released and brought into a new covenant. Is that amen? It can't be done in the flesh. It has to be done in the spirit. And why is it written in this heart? Because external observance of the law, although commendable, is not enough if from within the heart is not transformed. Jesus was never going for the outside. Jesus was always going for the inside. It has to be the transformation of the heart. To the Jews, they prided themselves in the circumcision in the flesh. Those who are circumcised, these are God's people. Paul writes later in the book of Romans, physical circumcision amounts to nothing if your heart is not circumcised. In the Levitical priesthood, although it was glorious in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, we know it is not perfect. That's what it says. The law could not bring you to righteousness. That's the Levitical priesthood. And then sometimes people will look at Hebrews chapter 7 says, and verse 11 and verse 12, it says, with a change of a priesthood means a change of a law. You see, the law is no longer relevant. 
But do you know something, my friends? Every covenant has a law. The old covenant had its laws. If you are in a new covenant, guess what? There are laws. Every covenant has laws. What's the difference? What's the change? Because the Levitical priesthood changed into the Melchizedek priesthood, right? We moved from the flesh to the spirit. You cannot depend on the flesh. It has to be in the spirit. Then we ask this question, how is this achieved? We have a standard Christian answer, of course, by grace, through faith, where we believe and the righteousness of Jesus imputed upon us, Holy Spirit given to us, that today we can live this law. Does it stop there? I wish it was. It would be much easier, more straightforward for us. But here comes the next point. The Spirit's work is not only evangelistic, but also enabling towards the eschatological entrance into the kingdom. Now, every word is very important down there. Evangelistic means it's salvific, right? Salvation. It's not just about salvation. It's also about obedience. Obedience to what? The law, the moral law. Whatever we need to keep still, we still have to keep. We have to keep the laws of God so that we may do in accordance to the Father's will. There's still work to be done. Does it mean that we just get involved in church stuff and activities? No, it's about assignments. I keep stressing this over and over again. Let me give you two verses, two passages only. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Jesus talks about entering into the kingdom of heaven many times. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will do that. But he who does what? The will of my Father in heaven. Oh, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So is the law still applicable? Yes, because we must practice lawfulness. And you can't be lawful if there's no law. The second passage is found in Matthew chapter 21, verse 28 to 32. But what do you think? A man had two sons and he came to the first and he said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he regretted and he went. Then he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not. Now, which of the two did the will of the Father? They said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. Which one did the will of the Father? It's about the Father's will. There's work to be done. So be careful when someone comes to you and says, Jesus has fulfilled the law. There's nothing else you need to do. It's half correct. It's half true. It doesn't stop only at salvation. It goes on to working the will of the Father, which is executing His laws, the righteous things on earth. Amen? And I call this the eschatological entrance into the kingdom. Because you know that we are living in, the, in between the now and not yet of the kingdom. We are the people of the kingdom and we belong to God's kingdom. But the Bible keeps talking about a time where God's people will enter and inherit the kingdom. That has not happened yet. And I know there are other people or other teachers who teach otherwise. To tell you that all Christians will enter the kingdom of heaven. We've got to study this. And if you don't agree with me, you dig into the scriptures and come to your own point of view. But don't just take something that sounds better that you like. Even if that is true, dig the scriptures so that you are clear of your position. But as far as I'm concerned, I know the kingdom is now and not yet. I'm giving you this huge picture of this 
passage has not been easy for me even just to prepare something like that. But we've got to press on a little bit more. Because we look at this and we say, great, well and good. But pastor, Jesus spoke to the Jews, right? See, nowadays, uh, today we like to look at the Jews and the Gentiles. You know? Then we say, oh, but he spoke to the Jews. Well, uh. <laughs> I'm Gentile, so I don't need to, to look at the law. I wasn't under the law, you see. I say, okay, so like, shall we explore this, my friends? I think it's important. Is the moral law applicable to Gentile believers of Yeshua? This is the question we want to ask, and we hope to answer this. We know that the ceremonial law, many of that do not apply to us. We don't have to become Jews. That's very, very clear to me. We're asking, are the moral laws applicable to us? Do you know that this was the same concern in the book of Acts chapter 15? Acts chapter 15 is what we call the Jerusalem Council. Fast forward for you, the few chapters before that, the Gentiles were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They received the Holy Spirit. They were saved and converted and became Christians as it were, followers of Yeshua, believers of Jesus the Messiah. Now that the Gentiles are saved, do they need to be circumcised? Because in their Jewish mind, if you're not circumcised, then you cannot be God's people. Do they need to be circumcised? And if you are circumcised, then you must keep the entire law. Finally, they decided, let us not trouble them, since they are already God's people by the Spirit, by faith. You've got to thank the Jerusalem Council for this one. Yeah? He said, ah, but a few things we want them to observe. They have to abstain from things related to idolatry. Nothing with idols. Secondly, abstain from sexual immorality. Thirdly, abstain from things strangled or abstain from the blood. Later on, broadly categorize idolatry, sexual immorality, murder. These three things they cannot do. All right? This is important for them to keep. They say, okay, three things, I'm fine. The rest I don't have to worry, right? As long as I don't violate these three, I'll be fine. Let's go back to the law. Do you know the law is made up of 613 commandments? How many of us can remember 613 commandments? Very difficult, right? I give you four statements, three words already cannot remember. 613 commandments. And the rabbis were always seeking a key principle. How do you summarize it? How do you summarize the law? And down through the years, the Prophets, for example, Micah, reduced it to three points. This is all that's needed for you. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly before your God. Three things, that's all. Okay? Like awaken, align, assign. Huh? Isaiah brought it down to two points. Maintain justice, do what is right. That's all, two points. Amos and Habakkuk brought it down to one point. Amos said, God says, seek me and live. That's it. Habakkuk says, the righteous will live by their faith. You see, they're all just trying to bring it down to one thought. Big idea. By the time it came to Jesus, remember there was a scribe who came to him, trying to test him. Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus actually gave him two passages, from two passages. He says, first, you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind. He took this from Deuteronomy chapter 6. But he didn't stop there. He says that the second is the same as the first. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And on this hang all the law and prophets. That's it. Love God, love neighbor. You cannot do one without doing the other. Both must come together and this summarizes the entire law. In the New Testament, Paul reduced it even further. One word. Love is the fulfillment of the law. All you have to do is love. And that's why the title is Just Love Law. <laughs> just love. That's all you need to do. That's just love. Sounds simple enough? Everyone happy? Gentile? Christians? Right? So all you need to do is love. But friends, we have a present day conundrum. What is love? 
Can you see our problem? Now? What is love? I mean, it's well and good. I tell you to love. But what is love? I don't have the time to share with you, but please go to this website called canyoudefinelove.com. And strangers will just write in their definitions of what love is. Huh? I'm, if you just go to this website, you'll see what I mean. There are Christian versions there, but let me read at least one or two to you, okay? Love is when you have a burning desire to be with someone. When you look into his eyes and he looks into yours and your heart melts as if you were staring at each other for hours. Okay, another one said, love, no one can define what love is. Maybe love for your family, friends, or someone who is beyond them. You didn't mean to find what love is because it is love who will find you. <laughs> I could go on. Okay, love is insanity, founded on stupidity and idiocy. <laughs> Behind that four-letter word is torture, an endless spout of pain and inhumanity, something we can't control yet search for every day of our lives. Just love, law, Like that, uh. What is love? This is what I'm trying to share here with all of us. And so to the, to the world today, love is like emotion, it's a feeling, it's sensual, it's erotic, it's sex, uh, it's experiential, it's passion, it's based on vibes, uh, different temperaments, it's inconsistent, it's unpredictable. And today we tell people love is actually freedom because you've got to let people do what they want to do, even if it kills them. How do you love like that? The Bible tells us that the word agape love, today we use the word unconditional, but I've looked at the theological dictionaries, there's no word called unconditional that's attached to it. Agape love is simply an act of will. It's a decision to act for the good and welfare of another. Do you understand what I'm trying to share here with you? I believe all of us in this room tend to swing at times even to a world's understanding of what love is. But agape is really making a decision to act for someone's good. But the question still must be answered. In a world where love has been redefined, how can we understand the love of Christ and how it is to be expressed in relationship with one another. Can I give you the answer? You've got to go back to the law of Christ because in and through the law, God expresses His love for His people. You see this? Can you see it comes one full circle? This is how God wants us to act well and good for someone. We find the definition of God's love, the way He desires us to love one another because His law is all about love. That's what it says. Jesus said it. You want me to summarize it? It's all about love. You love God, you love one another. In this one whole thing, it's the law and the prophets. It's all about love. Paul says love is the fulfillment of, of the law. So if you want to know what, the, what love is, you go back to the law. I know this is not nice sounding to anyone down here. Especially that line, go back to the law. Oh, I don't want to be under the law. I didn't ask you to go under the curse of the law. We've been set free from that. I'm asking you to go back to what God is all about and you'll find out through His law. He said, no, 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 I, I don't agree with you, Hanson. I still disagree. We are Gentiles. We are not under the law. Friends, do you know in guiding the Gentile churches, Paul, a Pharisee of Pharisees, trained under the bestest of Pharisees, under Gamaliel, drew from his own training and understanding of the law and prophets over and over again. How do you think he gave advice? From the law. It was his wrong interpretation that had to be changed by the Holy Spirit, by Jesus, so that now he can teach it. From where? From the law. He only spoke very strongly against circumcision, against the Judaizers who want to bring people under that bondage of a fleshly keeping to become God's people. He says, no, you don't have to do that to be God's people. You are already God's people. You have to distinguish between that. Today, there's a lot of confusion when we talk about the law. Let me quickly summarize this for you. 
I believe the law of Christ, interpreted with and through the love of Christ, reveals the heart of the king and the righteousness of his kingdom. See, when we begin to understand this, then we can see how this exceeds, this righteousness that's revealed, exceeds every human and feeble attempt at our own versions of righteousness. When we understand this, it exceeds every interpretation that we may have, however good our intentions may be. It far exceeds our understanding of what it means even to be a good person. Love is not opposite to the law. The law is not opposite to the love. Both of them are complementary. And you see the complementary action of love and law in and through Jesus' examples in the Sermon on the Mount. And when we come back, we will unpack it one by one. But can you see, if you understand the law and you can see that it is love that drives the law, then love seeks reconciliation. Love deals with the root issues of lust, of anger. Love would honor. Love goes beyond what's required to a second mile. Love does not draw an attention to self. We do things for our God in a very secret manner that God will reward. Love acts for another's good. Love calls out evil and wrong. Love warns, love disciplines, and love obeys. This is what love is. Not the mushy, feely type of understanding of what love is or a freedom of love or doing whatever you want to do. That's not the freedom Christ bought for us. The love of Christ fulfills the law of Christ. So I'm going to end this to tell you, not just to love law, but to love the law. Change that mindset. Once and for all, this one word, these three letters. If the law was so terrible, how can the psalmist write over and over again, I delight myself in your commandments, which I love. I love your commandments more than gold. Yes, fine gold. Your word is very pure. Your servant loves it. They love the law. They love the law. I'm serious. And I believe these psalmists inspired by the Holy Spirit, they were not being hypocritical when they wrote some of these songs. They love the law. How come today we look at the law and we look as if it's evil and it's bad when Jesus declares or when God declares through Paul in Romans that it is good, it is just, and it's spiritual. There's nothing wrong with the law. It's our understanding and our interpretation of it. And so as I close, finally, let me read these last statements to you. Jesus upholds the moral law of God. He is the king, and this is his law, the law of Christ. The law doesn't make us righteous, showing us that righteousness is beyond us. But by faith, counted as righteousness, for all of us, imputed with His righteousness, in that we exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. But we are made righteous that we can do the works of righteousness. And in that, the righteousness of the Pharisees is exceeded when we act in love. Our definition of love is guided by the moral law, for the law is a revelation of God, and God is love. Love is the fulfillment of of the law. Just love law. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your law. And I pray that you will show us the place of your law in our lives. Not to bring us under a bondage, but to release us into a freedom to love your word and to appropriate it for life. Help us, Lord, to understand this well. Change our minds, renew our minds, Lord, so that we know how to appropriate this, interpret this, and to live this well. And so guide us, Lord, especially because today we live in a society that tends towards lawlessness. We need to be people of the Word. We need to stand on your law. And so, Lord, teach us and enable us to love your word, to love your law, because we love you, and we will keep all.
that you ask us to do. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.